Assalamu alaikum. Almost all of us have been faced with the questioning of a child. By repeating one word over and over, he can be very frustrating to us as he asks, why? If you put a knife up out of his reach, he wants to know why. When you explain it sharp, why? And so you explain in order to cut fruit. And he says, why? And so it goes. It illustrates the dilemma of applying reason. What we have to do when we apply reason is first set the standards of proof. We decide for ourselves, what will I be satisfied with? If I find such and such and so and so, that constitutes for me a final proof. We have to decide that first. What happens, though, is that on the really important issues, the philosophical matters, thinkers set standards of proof, and then they take a look at their subject, and eventually they may arrive at their standards. They may arrive at the point which they said would constitute a proof. But then they ask for a proof of the proof. The key to avoiding this endless dissatisfaction is to satisfy ourselves about standards first. To satisfy ourselves that such and such a list of criteria constitute proof, satisfying proof. And then we test the subjects that we examine. In particular, I will apply this to the Quran. Now, Ask a thoughtful Christian why he is a Christian, and he will usually reply, the miracle of the resurrection. The basis for his belief being that about 2,000 years ago, a man died and he was raised from the dead. That is his miracle, his touchstone, because all else depends on that. Ask a Muslim, well, what is your miracle? Why are you a Muslim? Where is your miracle? And the Muslim can go over and take his miracle off the shelf and hand it to you. Because his miracle is still with us today. It is the Quran. It is his touchstone. While all the prophets had their signs, Moses had the competition with the magicians of Pharaoh. Jesus healed the sick, raised the dead, and so on. All prophets had their signs. The one sign given to the last of the prophets, according to the Muslims, is the book, the Quran. And this one sign is still with us. And doesn't that, after all, seem fair? That if prophethood is to end, that the last prophet should bring something that stays with us? So that today, in fact, a Muslim who takes his religion seriously suffers no disadvantage to Muslims who lived 14 centuries ago. Those people who kept company with the Prophet had access to no more information, no more of the necessary vital information we must have, than we have today. They had the Quran. That was assigned to them. It is still assigned to us today, the same miracle. Well, let's test the Quran. Suppose that I say to a man, I know your father. Probably he is going to examine uh, the situation and see, does it seem likely that he meet my father? And if he's not convinced, he'll start asking me questions like, you know my father, you say, is he a tall man? Uh, does he have curly hair? Does he wear glasses? And so on. He asks questions. If I keep giving him the right answer to all these questions, pretty soon he's going to be convinced, well, I guess this man did meet my father, like he said. You see the method. Now, here in the Quran, we have a book which claims that its author is one who was present at the beginning of the universe, at the beginning of life. So we have a right to address that author and say, well, tell me something. Prove it to me. Prove to me that you were there when the world began, when life began. In the 21st surah, in the 30th ayah, that is the 21st chapter of the Quran, the 30th verse, we have an interesting statement. It reads, Have not the disbelievers seen that the heavens and the earth were one piece, and we parted them, and we made every living thing from water? 
Will they not then believe? There are three key points here. First of all, it is disbelievers who are mentioned as being those who would see that the heavens and the earth were one piece and then parted and would see that all life came to be made from water. As it happens, the universally accepted origin of the universe is now the Big Bang Theory, which maintains that at one time all of the heavens and the earth were one piece, the monoblock it's called. And at a particular point in time, this was burst and continues to expand, and this gives us the universe we have today. This was a recent discovery, a recent confirmation. The Nobel Prize in Physics was awarded only a few years ago for those who confirmed the Big Bang origin of the universe. It was only about 200 years ago that Leeuwenhoek and others perfected the microscope and discovered for the first time that living cells are composed of about 80% water. Now those Nobel Prize winners and the Dutchman who invented the microscope were not Muslims, and yet they confirmed the vital statement that at one time the universe was one piece, that life is made from water, just as this ayah says. Have not the disbelievers seen that the heavens and the earth were one piece and we parted them and we made every living thing from water? Will they not then believe? Well, this sounds like an answer to the question we started with. When we asked of the author, tell me something that shows me you were present when the universe began, when life began. Now everyone must be committed to something. You have to put your foot down someplace. It is impossible to be neutral at all times. There has to be a point of reference in the life of any thinking individual. You have to take a stand somewhere. The question, of course, is to put your foot down in the right place. Now, since there is no such thing as a proof of a proof of a proof, and so on, in order to find the right place to put one's foot down, to take a stand, we have to search and find that place. And it's by a method that I hope to illustrate in this talk. It's a question of finding a point of convergence. You see, we search for truth in many places. And we begin to know that we're succeeding in finding the truth if all our different paths start to converge. They start to come together to the same point. If we are examining a book looking for evidence of divine origin and we are led to Islam, this is one path. If at the same time we are examining the words of all those who were called prophets and we find ourselves led to Islam, we have a firmly grounded basis for belief. We started looking for truth in two different places and found ourselves going down a path headed for the same destination. No one ever proves all things. We have to stop at some point being satisfied with our standards, as I mentioned earlier. But the point is, in order to take a stand, and to be sure it's in the right place, we want to examine all the evidence around us and see where does it lead us and anticipate this point of convergence to say it looks like all things are pointing to this place. We go to that place and then look at all the data around us to see if it fits into place. Does it now make sense? Are we standing in the right place? 